transition of consciousness that he received directly from Ganga Devi. It's a very mystical story that is there in the scriptures about him. And then he was always trying to run away from home, just exactly as Raghunath does was. And then but finally he managed to escape his parents' clutches and he ran all the way to Vrindavan. When he arrived in Vrindavan, he was weeping and weeping in ecstasy at being in that holy dharm. And the local Rajbasis, they ran to Jiva Goswami, who was the Mahant of Vrindavan at that time. And they told him, some beautiful boy has just arrived. You should go and see this boy. So Jiva Goswami, he went out with some of his followers to the back of the Jamuna. And he could see Naratam from a distance. And Naratam was very, very skinny and wasted from his long journey of coming from <coughs> Ketchari Gram to the other side of India. So, um, but Jiva Goswami is described, he saw a Swarti of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu feeding Naratam from his lotus, what his pot, his Kamadalu. He was feeding um, Naratam directly from here. And when Jiva Goswami saw this directly, then he realized, oh, this is such a special soul. And he took Jiva Goswami into his ashram, nurtured him back to health, etc. And then within a short space of time, he was wandering around in Braj, and he came to the ashram of Lokanath Goswami. And there he immediately felt an attraction and great affection towards Lokanath Goswami. And to such a degree that he actually begged initiation from the Lord Goswami and said, 100% no. I have taken a vow never to initiate any disciple in his birth. So then for many months after this, Naratam was trying in all different ways to get the attention and mercy of Lokanam Goswami. That was the beautiful pastime how Lokanam Goswami would go to perform his morning ablutions in the forest and Naratam would be hiding close by and Naratam would clean up that stool and lay nice fresh oil in that area and just generally clean all around the ashram of Lokanam Goswami. And after some time Lokanam Goswami began to realize that all this forest area is being very clean and someone is doing this. Who is doing this? So he hid one day in the forest and he caught Naratam. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? And uh, then Naratam was begging him, begging him with tears in his eyes. Oh, I just want to take your shelter. I just want to take your shelter. But still, Lokanath Goswami refused to accept the um, uh, mood of Guru in relationship to Naratam. So Naratam beseeched Jiva Goswami. Then Jiva Goswami interceded and begged Lokanath, just in this one case, you should accept this boy. This boy has come from a very royal family. He's a very specially gifted personality. <coughs> we should just accept him. So on the um, persuasion of all the Vaishnavas headed by Jiva Goswami, Lokanath Goswami decided to accept his one disciple. I'll just go for a few minutes. And um, then sometime later, while um, Narayan was sitting in the ashram of Lokanath Goswami, it was in summertime, hot summertime in Brajuda. Then one farmer came from nearby <coughs> and was begging water from Lokanath Goswami. Lokanath Goswami at that time was immersed in his bhaja and just didn't acknowledge at all this farmer who was begging for water. Then this farmer went to the young Naratam and was begging him for water. So Naratam, being a very soft-hearted soul, immediately went and got some water for that farmer. But then when Lokanath Goswami came out of his meditation, he realized what Naratam had done. And he was very angry, very upset. He had broken his bhajan just to give water to a thirsty farmer. And he chastised uh, Naratam severely and told him to leave his ashram forever. This is just like when Rupa Goswami chastised Jiva Goswami after Jiva Goswami had corrected that Brahmana for wanting to edit his book, the Bhakti Rasavita Sindhu. And um, uh, Jiva Goswami defeated this old man. Rupa Goswami was very unhappy about that and sent him away. So it seems difficult to understand these points, but nevertheless, Lokanath Goswami, he expelled 
um, Naratan from his ashram. And then um, there's a whole further story and so on. And then eventually, um, Jiva Goswami instructed Naratan and Srinivas Acharya and um, Shamananda. Shamananda. These three were great friends. They were studying, they were sadhus together. He directed them to take this uh, cart full of books across to. Um, we could discuss that last time about the water because there's all different aspects of it. But I only want to just touch on a few small points before going into our topic today. Because last time we spoke on Ramanujan, it went for like you know, almost 30 minutes. But I just want to quickly honor Narutam. So then they took the books to Bengal, these books, very precious books, jewels, and one king had a dream that a lot of um, wealth is coming through my kingdom in these carts. So he arranged for his servants to dress as dacoits, and they robbed that cart of all the books, and then Narakam, Srinivas, and Shamananda were totally bereft that they had no more books to take to Bengal. And Srinivas <coughs> Acharya, he remained in Bihar, this happened. And the other two, Shamananda and uh, I think it is Narutam, they went on for what is now Bangladesh and Bengal. Narutam took the birth in what is now today, Bangladesh, it's actually friend. And then uh, Srinivas eventually found these books and converted that king to Vaishnavism, spoke so beautifully and took all the books again to Bengal. And then it's described that there were many wonderful um, pastimes of Narutam in Bengal in his preaching. Narutam had a very special type of kirtan that nobody had ever heard before. He would sing particular ragas with the kirtan, and it was very, very, he always had a mood of deep separation and longing, the last of my year. He gave us two specific books, this um, pratana, and Brain Bhakti Chandrika, these two books, and they're all filled with longing, with a mood of this Lasamayi, just when will that time come? Goranga Bali Te Hare, we sing, when will. Huh? When, when will I have darshan of that Goranga Mahaprabhu? This mood of longing is the mood that the Sadak is praying to actually have, this mood of. Greed, longing to serve and be with Krishna. Radha Krishna Pranam, what do you call it? Yugalaki These beautiful um, bhajans that he would sing. We sing every day. Our song book is full of the songs of Maratam Das Thakur. That's why we should glorify very nicely and significantly and contemplate the glories and beauty and the sweetness and speciality of Maratam Das Thakur. So today is his. Appearance day and to take his shelter, I'm sure sometime today we'll sing many of his verses in the temple or in the uh, Chitta. So I'm sorry, not going to go in the evening. So, Narutam does Tampur. There are so many more pastimes. I've made it very, 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 very brief. But um, because I'm sure we will hear this evening, but I hope you will all be inspired sometime during the day to read the translations of his songs and to enter into the mood of Narutam Das as Ujjabhad Padmanabha Maharaj sang the other day. On these appearance days, it's so special because there's a special like window open to connect with this particular individual, whoever it is that we're glorifying. So we should always take advantage. Actually, um, Srila Bharati Maharaj just said, it's an offense yeah. if you don't glorify these particular personalities on their appearance or disappearance days. So we should be very careful and always to know when it are the if we're living somewhere separate from the devotees, we should always endeavor to stay keep in contact and know what are the appearance and disappearance days, etc. So today um, just like in the case of uh, of uh, Jiva, uh, yeah, Jiva Goswami, how, how he was sent away, but it, but it was resolved. So in the case of Narutam, 
Yes. Is there a story that it was resolved, or somehow he made amends with Lokanath Goswami that he had, just, you know, not come up to his standard? I don't know. Sri Guru Dev said that actually Lokanath Goswami, he saw Narada Thakur's tendency, like some have the tendency to be more introvert, others to be more extrovert. What? Some to be more introvert and some to be more extrovert is the vision that Lokanath Goswami had. So he requested him to do bhajan next to his bhajan kutir, he made another kutir. But he saw that he is too much inclined to interact with the environment and to bestow kindness. Yeah. So on that pretext of becoming angry, actually he was not angry. He gave him a very beautiful blessing. Now you go back to your where you came from, yeah, to your home place. Yeah, and you stay there. Yeah. So indirectly he gave him the blessing. Now you go and preach everywhere and you convert everyone into this is the very deep yeah, uh, reconciliation that we have to apply here. And Jiva Goswami confirmed that by sending three of them because this was an enormous responsibility. Because there were no books, no printed books. And they brought all the books like Maran explained. And then they started. And he especially preached by his ear thoughts, his mm -hmm. That was that last. Mm -hmm. yes, <laughs> this is the story of the first um, Gorpani festival in Ketchari where all the Vaishnavas came and Janavama came to that festival and deities were manifested at that festival. That's a beautiful, beautiful pastime. But thank you very much for that. I've often grappled with that conception. Why would he send him away for giving water? I've heard different things, but that's a very... Did you all understand the explanation clearly that Gurudev um, explained about that? That he was basically sent to his home, back to Ketri, which where he spent all his time teaching in that whole area. Yes, thousands and thousands of people. Yes, even non brahmanas He was very radical. No. Yes, yes, yes. He's um, Vilasa Manjari in the spiritual world. That's his eternal identity. That's why he's such a person. And after he was banished, banished, he still wrote Sri Guru Charana Padma. Ah. And with that song. Yeah, no yes. no yes. There's actually a very beautiful pastime when he leaves his body, when he's on a drive and carried through Vrindavan and his disciples are weeping. Now how will we tackle these smarter Brahmins? They're all saying that you died, you left your body because of your offenses and so on. How are we going to deal with that? So Narayan he just sat up after he actually left his body and went back to the ashram again. And they were all just astonished that he had brought himself back to life again. And then eventually he went back to Ketri Grant. And the disciples were always afraid that at any time he would leave his body. So they wouldn't actually let him bathe in the Ganga. So he'd sit on the bank of the Ganga and they would bring lotus and pour the water over it. And then one day they were pouring the water and they saw this like river of milk entering the Ganga. And they turned around and Narada wasn't there. He actually entered the Ganga in a form there are many, many pastimes described, but his disappearance is very magical, very sweet pastime. Shilanartam das hako ki jai gopi vi. I've been told they're collecting some of that now. You keep asking me For his samadhi. For his samadhi. Ah, yes. Many pastimes. So many pastimes. But we have a topic this morning. And we went 25 minutes into our time so. so now we're coming back to brush and just an appreciation from what I was speaking previously how the first nine cantos 
are leading to this doorway of Braj, Braja Prem, and try to get a mood and appreciation of these first nine cantos. You know, the first canto is pastimes about Parikshit Maharaj, and then in the end of that canto, then Shubhadev appears. And then Shubhadev Goswami is speaking the Chatu Shloki in the second canto, the Virata Rupa. Then in the third canto is actually when the Bhagavatam pastimes begin between a conversation of Maitreya Rishi and Vidura. And then in the third canto, there's a beautiful pastime of Baraha and Kapila Deva Ruti Samba. And then in the fourth canto, it's Shivji and uh, Daksha. And then Dhruva Maharaj, Prithu Maharaj, these personalities are in the fourth canto. The fifth canto is Jad Bharat and Rishabh Dev and uh, Priya Rata in the beginning. And then the hellish planets also are there and the cosmic all the different planetary systems and so on is still in the fifth canto. The sixth canto is Chitraketu, Rishikriti Sura, and uh, Arjamil. Seventh is Hirani Kashiku, Prahlad. And the eighth is the battle between the Devas and the demigods. The ninth is a lot of histories and it's out about Ramchandra and Barish, etc. There's a lot of dynasties. And at the end of the ninth chapter, the twenty-ninth chapter, end of the ninth canto rather, it's describing the Yadu dynasty, and then Parishit Maharaj begins his inquiry more about Krishna. <coughs> and then Shukadeva Goswami begins in the first chapter of the 10th uh, canto to describe the advent of Krishna, of Mathura, etc. So, as I described the other day, there are 335 chapters in the Bhagavatam itself, and there are 90 chapters in this 10th canto. So I described the other day how 32 of those chapters are directly Braja, and 40 chapters are Dwarka. And out of those 32 chapters in Braja, 15 are describing the demons' pastimes. And it's such a contrast we should appreciate coming from this very Aishwarya Samhita <coughs> the first nine chapters, into the very intimate, remarkably intimate, sweet, pastimes of Krishna and his family members. This is the trans this is the Rahasya. This is that most confidential aspect of the entire Bhagavatam. And it's so generous of Vyasade to give us this staircase. And it's such a simple transition actually to come into these childhood pastimes. There's nothing to conflict with our moral teachings, etc. until we reach the 21st, 22nd chapter, but by then our hearts should have already melted towards the sweetness of the bridge buses. And we shouldn't be too critical when it's describing Krishna's parakya pastimes, which come just in the 29, 30, 31, 32 pastimes like this. But these, all these moods are coming. Now Prabhupada used to say many times, what is the final conclusion? What is the um, Ultimate goal, he used to say one verse, Smarta Vya Shatatana Vishnu, Vishmarta Vya Nagatuchit. That always remember Krishna and never forget Krishna. This is the principal desire of our lives. So by talking about and remembering these sweet pastimes of Krishna in Braj, then we can very easily I mean what was the first book that Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada gave us all was the tenth canto. This is what he gave us. He knew we had to have this injection of the 10th canto without, Gurudev was saying this morning on the class, without hearing this Hari guitar, how can you have a taste? How can you actually go forward? How can you recognize what is the satya? So this taste is essential for us. And these pastimes in the 10th canto of Krishna's childhood um, battles with the demons are very enlivening for anyone to hear. So already we've been through, what was the first thing? Who can remember? Oh, Did you know? Well, Kamsa, someone asked me actually, why haven't you described, because I've sent out to a few people uh, all of Krishna's brush pastimes with people, but I didn't put Kamsa on there because he's not in brush. So this is about actually specifically just the brush demons. So Putana is the first demon. So Krishna is how old? Six Three or six days, it's described. Three days perhaps. Because straight away Nanda goes to Mathura. And then the next demon? Shakatasura. And how old was Krishna then? Three months. Very good. 
And then the next demon? Srinabrata. How old was Krishna? No, no, he was one year. Specifically one year. And then the next demon? Vasasura. And how old was Krishna then? He was about four and a half by that age. You can link them all through his ages. Like today we're going to talk about Bhakasura. Krishna is still in Balya Lila. He's still in Kumara Lila. He's still a child. His feet are quite small. He's still having to have people dress him. But he's kind of impatient now. He wants to actually dress himself. So in this beautiful Bhakasura demon, this demon Bhakasura is the brother of Krishna uh, and Pralamba and Keshi. They are all in the same family. So there's relationship everywhere, even with the demons. Agasura also. Agasura also. So it's a large family of full fledged demons they find comfort in. By the way, I've drawn another map here, and if you want to. If there's any artist who wants to do it with more. Um, Precision, but everything's in the same. Everything's in the. This is the kingdom of God. This is the spiritual world. This is where the Lord performs His eternal pastimes, and all our scriptures are pointing to come here. This Tanda Marupa Charita Di Sukiritana Tishten Brajay Tanuragi Janugami. That to reside in Braj is part of our. Sadhan Bhajan, or at least to have the aspiration and desire to reside in Brajan. We can't physically, at least by mind and heart. And we can do that by hearing and remembering these beautiful pastimes. So, by forest on one side of the Jumuna is Bhagavan, Bhagiravan, Bhagavan, Lomavan, Madhuvan, Mahavan, brother, sorry. And then remember the other day I told the story of how Krishna. He's, the last demon he kills in Goku is, well, it's purifying Nalog, Nalog Kubera and Mani Griva. This is considered a demoniac quality within these two sons of Kubera. So that's like the last pastime. After that pastime, when the trees crash down and almost kill Krishna, that's when all the elder Godvas got together and asked Nanda Baba, can we leave? And then they all left across the Jumuna. Came to Chattigara. Chattigara means circle of wagons. And then they went on to that next place called Rao. And then Basant. And it's from Basant that Krishna first took the cows grazing. That's where it's celebrated. So then this pastime comes sometime very shortly after. This Bhagasura comes just after Bhagasura. There's a place called Bhakastala. And it's between Basant and Govardhan. It's actually on this side because they circumambulated Govardhan before they stopped in their traditional abodes of Varshana and Nandagam. So this was the route that they took. We should have some conception of this. If we're trying to remember Braj, if Braj is our meditation and our contemplation, this is Braj. This is the, at least we can get a picture from here. So try to appreciate and you can take a picture of this or whatever. Try to get the geography, at least it helps a little bit. So now, the, uh, the, the Sakas and Krishna, they've all brought their car calves. And Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur, he's describing at this point that the number of calves that Krishna has is one <coughs> followed by 17 zeros. <laughs> so Kishore Mohan kind of calculated something quadrillion, trillion, whatever, you know. But that's how many calves Sri Krishna Chakravarti Thakur, that's how he describes it. One followed by 17. In other words, it's inconceivable. We cannot begin to use our material minds to really... Con Everything about this is transcendental, ultimately. Yet, nevertheless, it has the sweetness of relationships that we can understand, that we can be familiar with, and allow these pastimes to enter our hearts. This is, this is the collective amount of cards of all the radio. 
He says that the number of cars that Krishna and the countless Sakas were tending was one followed by 17. He says that the boy, there were hundreds of thousands of boys, very beautiful, and Krishna had one followed by 17 zero number of calves. There's no question of limit, uh, limitation or impediments or obstacles. This is all a chintya shakti. Mm -hmm. we have nine left cows. Yes, also, yeah. also, and we hear the different uh, descriptions of the um, uh, distances between places, like. We hear about Yamuna Tira all the time. The gopis were going to get water from Jamuna. So now Jamuna's over here. When they lived in Varshana, they would still go to Jamuna to collect water. So Jamuna has shifted. But also the whole um, movement of Braj can shift at any moment. Krishna would go to his late night rendezvous, and if he was a little late, it's described that Vrindadevi would come with a chariot like a lotus petal. And Krishna would get on that chariot, and as fast as the mind, he would actually reach the rendezvous place where Sri Radha was. But even Krishna could just take one step, and it could be like 30 miles or something. So distances and ages and um, time and numbers of cars, etc., it just grows and expands. It's not you can't hold it in your fists like this. It's a it's a deep place of worship and appreciation. This is where we will get the understanding. When our bhakti increases and our genuine devotion for the Lord and wanting to serve Him, then we will get the mercy to actually understand these things very clearly. Maharaj, yeah. this cow, sorry, one more question. Is that every cow and boy from their own I think this is a collective number that I've just given, one followed by 17 zeros, of all the cows <coughs> that all the suckers okay. were tending. Okay. So that will still uh, reconcile the 900,000 calves that just Krishna is bringing. Plus the calves of the 12 There must be, because they have so much milk. So, there's probably not a single day when you can say, well, it's this number, because by the end of the day, there's probably two or three more hundred calves born. So, you know, how can it be calculated? But we're trying to get some impression. That's why I made this map for you, to get some type of place where we can begin our meditation from a, a place that we can relate to. So, they come to this place, Bakastala. And it's described as being a reservoir of water. Now, Bakasura was no ordinary demon, just like his brothers and sister and so on. It's described by Jiva Goswami that his beak was on the ground and his upper beak was in Swagaloka. This is, we describe Trina Raja as being 800, flying 800,000 miles into the sky. So, again, these are vast distances that we're talking about. I mean, if we want to make some comparison between the Himalayas, you know, Everest is only 5.5 miles high. So all this was way, way beyond that. Anyway, the Sakas were a little bit intimidated because they realized this enormous bird, which was just standing very silently, was actually alive. And they became a little afraid of it because of its huge size. They became somewhat intimidated by that. Now, almost immediately, as soon as the suckers come to this reservoir of water, immediately, Bhagasura, he understands this is Krishna, and Kamsa has promised me a great reward if I can actually kill this Krishna. And there's a bit of history here that all the demigods previously have tried to kill Bhagasura. They burnt him, they chopped his wings off, they cut him. Indra used his thunderbolt to chop the wings off, and they did so. But he couldn't, he just grew his wings back again. They couldn't kill Bakasura. And there's a whole history in Gaga Samhita where they're trying to actually kill him, but they can't. So he's a very fierce, incorrigible demon. And immediately he swoops down with his beak and swallows Krishna. Immediately. And all the cowherd boys are just shocked and they all faint. 
and is described that Baladev could easily kill this demon, but he's so engrossed in a mood of sucker that he also thinks. He's so engrossed in this mood of affection towards Krishna that he also thinks. So then it's described that Krishna makes himself feel to Bakasura like a boiling coal or like a hot lead molten uh, piece of iron and immediately Bakasura cannot tolerate this heat in his throat so immediately he spits out Krishna and Krishna comes out completely normally and he's just standing there ready now to have a fight with Bakasura and it's described that normally Krishna is as soft as butter he's as sweet as a lotus flower but if someone is averse to him then it has this type of reaction and it's similar to um, these anartas that arise while we are chanting Hare Krishna they can become very prominent actually even though they're insignificant it's not that the holy name itself is um, influenced by these anartas but these anartas will arise as a result of chanting as a result of our aversion to Krishna these are the clearing stages. So then Bakasura begins to peck and try to catch Krishna. And Krishna is dodging very nicely. And then Krishna, meanwhile, amongst this battle, Krishna, he revives with his mystic vision, all the cowbird boys, so they can see him kill Bakasura. If he just left them all lying in their fate, they wouldn't see this beautiful drama that he's going to display. So they all come back to life and they're all shocked and aghast when they see this huge demon trying to peck at Krishna. And then Krishna, he grabs the beak and he opens it. And it's not described exactly, but I'm trying to understand how did he bifurcate that beak if Bakasura was so big. I was thinking he must be having his feet on the bottom part, his hands on the top, and walking up the beak, just gradually opening and opening and opening and opening and opening, opening, until finally it just bifurcated. Exactly the same way that Jarasandha was actually bifurcated like that. So then Bhagasura was completely destroyed. And then it's described that the Govas, they had never seen such an enormous demon before, the Sakas. They had never seen Krishna perform such a heroic act. And this pastime, makes a big impression on them of fearlessness. They're never again afraid of anything after they've seen Krishna destroy this Bhagasura demon. And then straight away, all the devas and the uh, residents of Swagaloka, they begin to shower Krishna with these Maliki Pushpa flowers from the Nandakana gardens. And they sounded music and conch shells and offered prayers. And all the boys were struck with wonder and they were filled with joy and they embraced Krishna. Then they gathered their calves and they returned to Braj. And at this time, they speak to all the Brijbasis about this heroic act of Krishna. Previously, we were hearing that when he killed Vasasura, Krishna made them be secret about it. Otherwise, he was afraid that his mother would stop him from coming out. So, but this time, um, Krishna feels a little more confident that he can wrestle with his mother and get his own way and actually go out. It's a very dynamic relationship here. And then um, they come in and the Calvert boys begin to speak these beautiful pastimes to the residents. And it's described how in one part of their hearts they're feeling great joy at their beloved Krishna being the great hero. And another part of their hearts, they're feeling great horror at practically Krishna was killed. And imagine if Krishna would have been killed, because Bakasura was thinking, if I can kill Krishna, then all the Brijbasis will die. He understood they all depend on Krishna. So this was his actual desire. So this is um, the pastime of um, Bakasura. And then it's described how the Gopas and the elder Brijbasis, they would 
spend their time glorifying Krishna. And it's described how the how other people in other villages they would come to where Nanda Baba was at the bridge Basis and say, Why are you always glorifying your children? Why don't you glorify Narayan? I mean Narayan is the goal of life. You should be glorifying Lord Narayan. This is who you should be worshipping. Why are you worshipping this young boy? But it's described that Brijvasis would just ignore them <laughs> and carry on. They didn't even take any notice of them at all. Because how can you begin to describe your relationship with Krishna, which is just completely, you're soaked in it, to someone who doesn't have that relationship? So these Brijvasis would answer in this way. They would just continue to sing about Krishna. And any hunger, it's described, that the Brijvasis ever felt was only hunger from being close to Krishna. This was all they wanted. Actually, we talked at the beginning about Kamsa being one of the greatest demons because he was the controller of all the other demons. But the real greatest demon in Braj, which we're not going to talk about so much in these classes, is their separation mood from Krishna. And it took Krishna 100 years to actually come back to Braj and destroy that demon of separation. So that is what the, that's the hearts of the bridge Vasis. This is how much affection and attraction they have for Krishna. Oh, also at this time, um, the same point in time, Krishna begins to demonstrate his expertise at playing his flute. Gurudev has described to us why did Krishna even take up the flute when he was very young. You remember the past time? Because he knew his brother was much bigger and stronger than him and would probably get all the ladies be attracted to him. But Krishna wanted to attract all the damsels of Braj. So he thought, well, if I play the flute, this will become counter the attraction of Baladev. Then I'll have some, you know, less competition in the field. So Gurudev described like this. This is actually why he began. And he played. When he was very, very young, he always had a flute. But he didn't really demonstrate this flute until this age. Now he's on the cusp, actually, of... He's still Kumara. But the next pastime, Adasura, it's going to be described how he was actually on the cusp of Ganda age. This is the next age from Kumara. So... Well, I'll tell you a minute. So when Krishna was playing his flute, at that time, all the devas were totally astonished. Because the devas, they hold all the intricacies of rag, etc., the Gandharvas are the principal musical personalities in the universe. But they were totally stunned when they heard the brilliance and sweetness and beauty of Krishna's flute playing. So this was also um, performed at this time. And this demon, is, um, is described as represents duplicity <coughs> and cunning, deceptive behavior and hypocrisy, the outward manifestations of false lifestyle of cheating activities. So principally duplicity is the um, anarta that Bakasura represents to be pure life. You can not hear at the beginning, but when we used to sit and speak these in front of Gurudev, he never gave a lot of prominence to discussing the different anartas. He just wanted to hear the juice of the pastime. And when sometimes we would go in detail into false guru or something, Gurudev would just say, sit down, and then ask for another demon to be described. So I'm not spending a lot of time there in trying to maintain but the principle that I'm trying to bring here to light is the speciality of this tenth canto in its completeness of where the journey through the other nine cantos have led and how this is the Prayoji Tattva, how to keep that very prominent in the heart. It is described in his last life, he was um, a Sohotra, his name was, 
and disciple of Durvasa Muni. Um, and along with his three brothers, Pralambo, Kesha, Keshi, and Agasura, he performed austerities at Pushka Tirtha. Then one of the three of them, oh, the three, while the three of them were picking lotuses at Chitra Sarova to offer to Krishna, they were arrested by the servants of Lord Shiva. And Shiva received them nicely. But he told them, I have promised to Parvati because all of these hundred thousand lotuses belong to her. And she is offering a hundred lotuses a day following a brat. And I have pledged that anyone who comes to take these lotuses from this coin to interrupt Parvati's worship, I must curse to be a demon. So even though they were worshipping Krishna, but they picked these lotuses and therefore there were less than the amounts needed. Therefore, Lord Shiva, he curses them to become demons, but he says you will all be liberated by Krishna. So these demons are also special personalities because they actually receive sometimes um, Vaikuntha, Swaru, Mukti, or they receive higher forms of liberation. So this is what we'll come to more, we'll discuss more closely when we come <coughs> into Agasura. And at this time, in the 10th canto also, it's describing many of their playful pastimes in the forest. But when we come to Agasura in particular, these pastimes are brought out more prominently because it's described that actually this demon Agasura, when he was witnessing these very beautiful pastimes, he became so envious of Krishna because this demon Agasura is embodied in the form of a snake and snakes just have to crawl on the ground. So snakes don't like to see other people very happily engaged and so on. So these pastimes are brought more prominently by Shukadeva Goswami when he's describing this next pastime. We've reached the 12th chapter now with Agasura. The previous chapter was 11. If you mark these chapters as you go through, it gives you some reference place. So Krishna, he leaves Vrindavan in about the 40th chapter. He goes to Mathura. And then there's a word Mathura past time. But then again, uh, Shukde Goswami comes back in the 46th and 47th chapter with Brahmara Gita to witness the height of the separation of the Vrindavasis. So try to make a connection just in the sequence. This is what I'm also wanting to bring out during this seminar. Because Shri Krishna Chakravarti does it constantly. He's linking all the chapters together. He's linking all the cantos together. So we're starting to see the Bhagavatam as one complete unified body of one jewel and how it's unfolding and spreading out. This is the nature of the Bhagavatam. So now it's described that Krishna wanted to take a picnic in the forest. And on this particular day, Baladev Prabhu was kept at home by Mother Rohini because it was his birthday and he had to celebrate that day very nicely. Huh? His birthday constellation, yes, that's what. Mm. Yes, and Baladev had to be present there. So he wasn't with all the cowboy boys on this day. There's a few days when Baladev is going to be absent, also in the Kaliya Nagapasta. He wasn't there initially. So Krishna requested his mother to, could he take now a full picnic in the forest? And then his mother, she prepared all those delicious preparations, etc. And then it's describing the number of cowherd boys, hundreds of thousands, and like I said previously, so many cars were there. And all the cowherd boys, their mothers would dress them very beautifully with jewelry. But very quickly they would take that jewelry off and they would replace it with just leaves and flowers and the mineral colorings from the forest. They prefer to have that natural type of mood. Understand the affection that the cowherd boys have for Krishna at this point. It's described in Govinda Gaurita. 
how the cowherd boys every morning they would be dressed by their mothers and they would be saying quickly dress me Krishna is dying to see me they were aware of Krishna's love for them so this mood is very sweet to appreciate that it's they're aware of how much Krishna loves them so they are feeling that Krishna is their very life and soul but Krishna is feeling even more affection for them he feels that, that they are all his life and soul also this is why he becomes so disturbed with these demons when they actually try and threaten the Calvin boys so always appreciate this factor of Krishna's deep attraction and affection for these remarkable Nitya Siddha Parikas of his in Goloka Vrindavan. So now the commentators begin to describe Shukadeva Goswami is describing in many verses here of the speciality of their pastimes, how they would steal each other's lunch bags. And Gurudev loves to tell that pastime how they would take out of samosa some of the filling and replace it with some flowers. And then that boy would get his lunch bag back and then eventually he'd be eating his samosa but it would have flowers in it so it full of very bad fact. And all the boys were very delighted to see this kind of thing. But understand, these types of moods, he's telling to Parikshit Maharaj. He's just been hearing about all these kings and Dhruva Maharaj and all these great Pritu Maharaj, these great personalities. All that greatness now has suddenly come to appreciating these most sweet pastimes of these children. It has a great intimacy to it. This is the kind of chemistry, so to speak, of these pastimes. And then it's described that Krishna would run ahead sometimes and the boys would run, see who could catch him first. And it's described how they would sing with their flutes and their beautiful cowherd horns. And they would imitate the birds. It's described, I was describing the other day when Krishna goes from Gokul across to Nandagam, which takes about two, just over two years to actually reach because they're grazing all their cows on the way. Krishna is so fascinated by all the bird life of Brush and the trees of Brush and the flowers of Brush. Because if we read any of these pastimes of Bhavanamrita or Govindalamrita, it's filled with these different descriptions of trees and flowers, etc. And I can remember when Srila Gurudev was one time in Hawaii and he was walking through a garden with one of our gardeners called Kamala Kanta, young gardener who had a nursery and everything. He's been a gardener most of his life, knows all the names of all the flowers. And he was walking with Gurudev, and Gurudev knew every single name of all the flowers. He was saying, oh, this is a champa, this is a this, this. And he was saying all the names of all the flowers. And Kamala Kanta was thinking he was there to tell Gurudev the names of the flowers, but Gurudev knew all the names of the flowers. This is part of the flavor of brunch. Actually knowing who are all these personalities, Brenda David has planted every single blade of grass, every bush, every flower, every tree in Brunch. So all of their pastimes are revolving around this beautiful natural setting of the sweetness of Brunch. It, it's such a cultured mentality when we actually enter this natural setting of Brunch. It evokes so much sweetness of nature itself. And this was the crest jewel, this was the backdrop for all of Krishna's pastimes. So these boyhood pastimes, like imitating all the birds, they knew exactly all the types of birds. One time I was lucky enough to live in Brindakon for six months, and I wrote down all the different types of birds that came to the con every day. And there was 25 varieties of birds. That's even now in Kaliyuna. 25 varieties of birds would come to the con. So what to speak of Krishna's time? How many hundreds of thousands of birds would actually um, be there? And it's described how the boys, they would chase the shadows of the birds. The birds would be flying and they would show their expertise at running as fast as the birds could fly and following the shadows of the birds. And they would be having competitions with each other. And then they would sometimes sit with the ducks very silently, like rishis or moonies and pretend to be like a duck and just sit with them. And then they would imitate the peacocks and the frogs jumping 
by the waterfalls, and then they would echo their voices through the caves. They would play all these very sweet pastimes, and it's described by the Acharyas that the Gyanis can never remotely relate to this. The Gyanis are so sober in their mentalities, and the Yogis also are so austere in their practices. They can never even approach the frivolity and sweetness and carefree nature of these descriptions. They're sitting way back. So these are specific um, words spoken by Shukadeva in this chapter 12 about the Gyanis and Yogis. They don't have this sort of fortune to even hear about these pastimes. So we should feel ourselves very blessed that we have this open door. Simply by the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu can we enter these pastimes. Previously, all the worship of Lord Narayan was all totally Aishwarya till the advent of Rajendra Nanda and Krishna. It's only his advent that opens the doors to these very selected, sweetest pastimes. And um, it's describing how Krishna is not at all easily attained. And it's describing how um, Shri Krishna Chakravarti Thakur in this part of the Bhagavatam describes something very beautiful. He describes that um, this being self-situated indicates that seeing Krishna does not depend upon the performance of sadhan. So we have, this is quite a radical statement, it's not depending on our number of rounds, of our number of prikramas, etc., that we will have the adhika to actually see Krishna. There's something more special. It's according to our various sanskars from previous births, etc. But it's the principal attraction, just that free, carefree attraction to Radha and Krishna. It's not by copious rounds, etc., that is necessarily going to give us that adhikar to actually come to Krishna. Sometimes I see with some of these young <coughs> Gurukul children, they're actually more attracted to Krishna than I think I'll ever be. I'm chanting all these rounds, living in Braj, doing something, but they're just naturally attracted to Radha and Krishna because of something very special in the previous birthdays. But that's the place where we want to go to, that place of spontaneous attraction to Krishna. And it's not dependent on sadhana, sadhana bhakti, bhava bhakti, and prema bhakti. We must be very focused on that. It says that um, there's a word, it's called svayam stita. And Vishnu Chakravarti is explaining that as being self-situated. And it indicates that seeing Krishna does not depend on the performance of sadhana. So self-situated. It doesn't depend on our sadhana. It doesn't depend on our expertise in Vedanta, etc. This, is, this helps the mind come to that place. But the actual place of taste is in something much sweeter than that, much more simple than that just by appreciating these pastimes of the young boys. And it's described now that the demigods, they drank immortal nectar daily, but still they feared Agasura. Agasura was very fearful, like Bagasura was. <laughs> these descriptions create a greater hero in the form of Krishna. Men like to be a hero. It's part of the nature. What to speak of amongst boys? Boys liked to have a hero. But the way Krishna was the hero, he didn't create a fragment or scent of envy. Nobody wanted to be like Krishna. They just appreciated Krishna as the hero. It's not that they wanted to surpass, there was no competition. They didn't want to you know, do something better than they could have done anyway. But they didn't even have the desire to do that. They were so happy and so much in love with Krishna that it just fitted so perfectly. This is the spiritual dynamic. This is Gokul, Vrindavan in its upper part. Is that Krishna is that center you described the other day. Krishna is Rasol Vaisal. He's the repository of all Rasa. And we are there to nurture that Rasa. 
So this is the perfect picture of that nourishment of that rasa. This relationship that wasn't even remotely and except for one, Agasura. And when he saw them enjoying this way, like I've just described, in its snake body crawling along the ground, he thought, why should these boys be so happy? He became so miserable to see these boys in such ecstasy and carefree uh, activities they were performing. Yes, I just read that twice already. He's the brother of Putana, and the brother of Paloma, and the brother of Keshi. Baka. Oh, Baka, Baka. Yes, and he's also, yes, he's the younger brother of Putana, and Baka Sora. So, yeah, remind me if I miss something. Um, you were mentioning how the Kaveri boys, they always accept Krishna as the greatest hero, no? Yeah. They don't also have a desire to project themselves as a greater hero. Yeah. But then that reminded me of the little story of one in Mangal. Remember that one? You told Krishna. Yes. Yeah. 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 attracted to you because... Just because you have a flute and yeah. a peacock head. That's in Keshi Dima. Did you tell that? That's that when we come to Keshi Dima. But still, the boys, you reminded me, would still fearlessly wrestle with Krishna. Easily wrestle with him. And sometimes Shriya would defeat Krishna. And Krishna was very happy. But Krishna would never really accept him. Gurudev describes one time Shriya had Krishna on the floor. And Shriya was saying, I am victorious. And Krishna said, no, my nose is in the air, your nose is down. So I am victorious. So they would argue, but it was all so beautifully done between them. Like they were great heroes, great heroes amongst the Sakras. Vijay is a particular, like a Chatriya spirited hero. He would carry a bow and arrows and Mother Yashoda had ordered him just to protect Krishna from all the demons. He was ready to give his life thousands of times to protect Krishna. They all had that mood. But still Krishna is the sweetest, complete hero of all of them. It's unbelievable actually to appreciate the depth of that. So the demigods were very afraid of Aga. And they were happily watching these pastimes. And then Krishna's Leela Shakti. The Leela Shakti comes into quite a little bit of play here. Which is a Shakti separate from Krishna. It's coming from Yoga Maya. She inspired Aga to come near the boys. Agasura. She inspired him. So when um, Agasura was so envious seeing all this because he was only experiencing suffering. He wants to avenge his brother and sister's death. So he comes close and then he puts one of his uh, bottom lip on the road and the other lip is high, high in the sky amongst the clouds. And he rolls his tongue out like a great pathway. Now, when the boys see this, their first thought is, oh, this must be a demon. But then they're not sure. Because Agasura is like frozen. He's very, very still. And he's making himself look like a mountain cave. So they're not quite 100% sure. There's no movement there. But they think, if he's a demon anyway, we've seen him kill Agasura. So there's no way this demon cannot be defeated by Krishna. So then they all decide to enter this demon. Krishna doesn't want them to enter the demon's mouth. Krishna at that time, it just happened that he was standing back somewhat. And all the cowherd boys, they're looking over their shoulders at Krishna, thinking, come on Krishna, we're going to go into this cave. And they start walking up the tongue. Actually, Manu Mangal doesn't really want to go also because he can smell a fishy kind of smell coming. I mean, he's not quite sure at all. He's a little bit timid. Manu Mangal is a brahman. He has plenty of fear within him, you know, from these type of things. All the other boys, the Karmaragri, etc., then he goes along with it. But Krishna doesn't want them to go in. And it's this Satya Sankalpa that any desire of Krishna must be fulfilled. So Krishna is calling out, don't go, don't go, don't go, wait, wait, wait. But due to this Leela Shakti, the coward boys, they don't pay him any attention. They don't hear like this. So it's like an example of the Leela Shakti superseding Krishna's power of Satya Sankalpa. 
Krishna's power that everything I think will actually manifest in deference to his suckers. His suckers' desire has overridden Krishna's desire. And Leela Sakti, Shakti understands that this will please Krishna more in the end. So even though Krishna is trying to stop them entering, but still, due to Leela Shakti's potency, they're able to enter the mouth of other. And once they enter the mouth, of course, with those poisonous fumes from the stomach, etc., they all lose their life. This is all the cards also. I mean, we've got to appreciate how big was an Anasura. Massive, massive to all these cards go in. So then when Krishna sees this situation, he's a little bit shocked and he's a little bit astonished. And he thinks, it's described, that the boys have helplessly gone beyond my control. And these boys are more dear to me than my very own life. And Krishna became momentarily very unhappy with that. And thinking that they'd actually all died. So then Krishna tightens his belt and decides, right, now I'll enter. Then he comes in, and it's described at this point, when he enters the mouth, the cave-like mouth of Agasura, all the demons, because Kamsa has his servants around Kamsa is never far away from Krishna. His servants in the shape of different sorts of disguises, trees, and all kinds of things. They're all hanging around or flying in the sky, observing what's happening. And they all saw Krishna enter, so they tell Kamsa very quickly, Oh, he's entered the mouth of Adasura. All the demons become uproariously happy. They become very joyful. But the devas, they become so unhappy. Because they're thinking, now Krishna will meet his end. Because they know how powerful Agasura is. So when Krishna's in the throat of Agasura, then he realizes the devas' unhappiness and the demons' joy. Now he wants to reverse those two feelings in both of them. He wants the devas to rejoice, he wants the demons to be miserable. So it's described that at that time, it's the first time that he expands his body. All of the other pastimes up to this point, Krishna hasn't actually expanded himself. He's maintained a mood of um, sweet madhurya. He's just killed Trinavrata with his hands, with the lips of into Bhutana, and uh, what, Shakadasura with his feet. He hasn't actually, and Vatsasura just swung him around. But now he's actually, his Aishwarya Shakti is manifesting. And the devas, they can see this. The devas know all the time, actually, who is Krishna. But still, sometimes they forget, due to the incredible nature of the dramas, the pastimes that have been at that time, they become very intimidated by them. But Vatasura, he became hot. Yes, but he didn't expand himself. He just became hot and was spat out. So this is also not like Ashwar. Huh? No, Krishna doesn't kill any. I already explained all this. No, but he was saying that he's saved from his Agasura. Yes. And all he did was come hot to get spit out. Yes. He didn't kill them like yes, his hands and everything. Yeah, and this, he didn't, this doesn't describe that he grew. That's why I was trying to figure out how many he actually bite him. He's such a small boy. He's a big thing. He's a walked up the step. But with um, Agasura, he does expand to kill his whole throat. So Agasura can't find any space to come out except through that Brahma Rudra in the top of his head. So then he comes out in a great brilliance on the top of his head. And it's described that Krishna allows this to be seen by everyone to demonstrate that even if he kills or is responsible to kill him, actually Krishna says at the end of every demon, I didn't want to kill him. It wasn't anything to do with me. He just opened his mouth and I just went in and he just left his body. What did to do with me? And he's, he acts very innocently commentators say about this. He wasn't, he wasn't had any bad intention towards it. Krishna won't break his madhurya for a demon. The madhurya will remain prominent. So then when this light is very bright, it's described that Krishna wants to show everyone his Mukunda feature. Mukunda means the giver of liberation. And he will give even liberation to this great demon. So that's why this light is just waiting outside the head of Agasura. And then Krishna, by his merciful glance, revives all the boys and calves, and they all come out through the tongue again of this cave. And Agasura remains in his position.
because actually Agosura is going to remain like this for the next 12 months. His body will be there. And of course, his body won't have any bad odor. It's fully fragrant, just like Putama's body became totally fragrant by the touch of Krishna. So Agasura's body has become totally fragrant and it actually remains there for 12 months because we'll get to that reason why in a minute. But um, then all the calves and coward boys come out and then they are really praising and glorifying Krishna. And Krishna is so relieved to have all his suckers again out of that practically close and so he also is feeling great jubilation at the reunion with all the cowherd boys. So after this pastime has happened, oh then of course Lord Brahma, he has heard that actually Krishna has walked into the mouth of Agasura. So he comes to witness the passing away of Agasura and he sees this light hanging in the sky. And then to his astonishment he sees that that light actually enters the feet the lotus feet of child Krishna and then he's really astonished. So it's at this point that Lord Brahma decides, oh, he is inspired by Yoga Maya. Now I will actually perform a pastime that will prove that he's not the master of all mystics, that actually I am the master of all mystics. So this is the next Leela, which is the Brahma Vimohan, the bewilderment of Lord Brahma. So this it comes from that point. And then after this um, killing of Agasura, it's described that all the Kalman boys, they go to the bank of the Jumuna and they nicely take their bath of Agasura. And the revival of Krishna and this trauma that has just actually happened in their playing, this manifestation of this demon, Krishna wants to keep everything in the highest tempo, the highest spirit. So this is part of the reason why Lila Shakti invites all these demons to come into Braj and leave their bodies. As well as, of course, show the great heroism of Krishna particularly. So this is where we are just coming into the um, pastime of uh, Brahma, Vimokha and Lila. So, after this pastime, I'll just describe who Agasura was. So he represents a mentality of cruelty to others and violence and causing trouble to others out of envy. This attitude is offensive to chanting Nam and creates miserly, a miserly attitude. If we have that kind of cruel mentality. They're all shades of envy. Actually, all these are coming from that one point of that envious mentality. So Agasura is like a very pronounced form of envy. This is what he actually represents. And the Gaga Samita describes him as being called Shakasura. And he was proud of his attractive body. And one time he saw the sage Astavakra, who Asta means eight, who is bent in eight places. And he laughed at him and said, Who is this ugly person? The sage cursed him to become the ugliest snake on earth. When Aga fell at his feet and begged for mercy, the sage blessed that he would be delivered and liberated by Krishna. So it's described extensively that this liberation is in the form of Swarup Mukti in Vaikanta. They don't actually get a form in Braj. They get liberated into Vaikanta. They're not elevated sufficiently to go to Braj. They perform the pastime in Braj, but they don't get elevated ultimately to Braj. They remain in Vaikanta. So this is the condition of many of the demons. And Putana goes to Golok. Like, which is actually a peripheral of Gokul and she becomes like a nursemaid if you can describe that song. But they actually, the uh, charyas have gone into such extensive detail for all of these different demons. We can read in this Gopal Champu, you can read it in English and you can read another Vrindavan Champu also.
discusses extensively these things, but we should. And Krishna's storybook, Prabhupada also describes very good. But this should be, don't think, oh, this is just some sort of story. Now let's get back to the real thing of Gyan Tattva. This Gyan Tattva, actually, Gurudev has described that the Gyan, or the Tattva, is like the horse. And the rider of the horse is Leela. The Leela is higher than the Tattva. It's the Leela that is going to touch the hearts of the Sadhus. It's the Leela that is going to keep us engaged in Krishna's service ultimately. Because you can go through so many years performing so many sort of like almost robotic services, doing all your various duties. But at some point, something in the heart wakes up. Why am I doing this? And if there's no attraction has been developed, then Gurudev said it's a very critical stage if we haven't actually reached that direct attraction to the pastimes of Radha and Krishna, also the pastimes of the childhood pastimes of Krishna. So to become familiar with these pastimes is a support to take us into transcendental brunch. So don't neglect them, thinking, oh, I've heard that a million times. It's actually described at the end of this pastime that Parishit Maharaj becomes so enlivened and he's asking um, Shubhadeva Goswami very beautiful questions about this pastime to such a degree that Shubhadeva Goswami loses consciousness at this point in the Bhagavatam. He actually falls down and loses consciousness. He can't speak anymore because he's so much immersed in the memory of Brajalila. And then it's described, described how Vyas and Narad and the other and Parashara Rishi, they come and very loudly they have Kirtan in his ears, bringing him back to life. And after many hours it's described by Sri Krishna Chakra Temple that Shukadeva Goswami is revived. And then he can again speak this, because Parichit is asking, how come you're describing this Avasura pastime as if it happened after the Brahma Vimohan Leela? Because now there's going to be like an illusion for 12 months. We'll describe all this yesterday, uh, tomorrow in detail in connection with the Brahma Vimohan Leela. Give the example of the horse. the horse. Yes, the horse is Tatva Vichar and the rider is Rasa Vichar. Oh, the rider. Yes, the rider. And the rider represents the Leela. Unless we can get an attraction, because there is so much Gyan for us to wrap our intelligence around and make us feel very important how I'm managing to actually understand so much, you know, Tatva. And aren't I brilliant and can't I deliver it so nicely? And as we get older, perhaps we're getting more proficient at doing that. But if we miss this ingredient of relish, principally relish in the heart for these pastimes, then we actually haven't got the satya, the whole goal, the bhava, that bhava practice. So that's our prayer to actually relish the taste somehow or other. And by reading these commentaries of these acharyas, that taste of the power of the Jai. Shilurude ki jai. Kanto ki jai. Shilurbhagavatam ki jai. Rajdhan ki jai. Naito de Vaishnava Rinda ki jai. Naratam das Thakur ki jai. Gaur Prigada. Kripa Sindhu ki jai. Patita Nam Pavi Vaishnavi jai.